Welcome back, everybody. We are getting into our next topic as we're laying this foundation for inferential statistics. We've covered probability and inference so far. Now we're going to cover our third hypothesis testing. Again, this is the third building block for inferential statistics. So what we're going to cover in this section here is something called null hypothesis significance testing, and then some problems that come in with that process called type one and type two errors. We're going to spend most of this time breaking down null hypothesis significance testing, because that's the kind of the main focus here. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Uh, this phrase here is a bit wordy. It's better abbreviated by the acronym NHST, and that's how I'm gonna to refer to this process moving forward. So make sure that you know that NHST means Null Hypothesis Significance Testing, okay? Now, I wanna start us off uh, breaking down this, this uh, concept here uh, with an illustration. So let's say that I have this question. I have a very general question, as we usually do, right? Well, our questions that we have are very general. We ask things such as, Let's say I ask, are math and English majors smarter than the other, okay? Well, I'm, uh, let's specify that question a little bit better. We, it's really hard to test general questions, so we need to specify it into something called a research question, where we're going to have some more technical language here. So when I take the question, are math and English majors smarter than the other, more technically what I, what I should ask, if I want to test this scientifically, is, is there a significant difference between the average IQ of math majors and English majors. Notice a few features of the research question compared to the general question, right? I am taking uh, math and English majors, so I've got that, and I'm taking their smartness that I've asked in the general question, and we're applying something we can measure. Uh, well, how do I measure smartness? Let's just say I measure it by IQ. And I take the average IQ, right? Because we like to work with averages. It's one number that can represent a large group of people. So I want to know, are they smarter than one another? One thing that can tell me that is if there's a difference between the average IQs of the math majors compared to the English majors, right? So that's how we take that general question. We make it a little bit more uh, specified, more scientific, you might say. It's one that we can actually put to the test. Uh, so let's say that I gather some data. Uh, from math and English majors, and I gather a uh, that the math majors have an average IQ, a mean, of about 112, and the English majors have an IQ of about 116. Now, you can see that there is a difference between them, but that doesn't um, immediately mean that they are different from each other in, from a statistical perspective. So let me break down what that means. Let's continue on here. So how is it that I can really begin to answer this question? Well, what I need to form then is a possible answer to this question. And I can put that answer to the test. So this possible answer to a research question is what we call a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction about the outcome of, a, of an analysis reflecting the research question. So the question is, is there a difference between math and English majors average IQ? A hypothesis could say, yes, there is a difference between their average IQs. Right? So that's a prediction. That's an answer to the question, a prediction about what the outcome of testing that question will be. Uh, another uh, phrase that's used to refer to hypothesis is an educated guess. Uh, emphasis on the educated guess is in the sense that I'm making some proclamation about some outcome that hasn't happened yet. Right. So I'm guessing or I'm predicting about what could happen, but it's educated, meaning that it's based on Logical reasoning, it's based on prior work and evidence that's been done in this area. So maybe there's prior research on intelligence and what major you pick. And I'm going to form a hypothesis to my question based on what I've researched prior. So it is an educated guess or prediction. So what are the qualities that make a good hypothesis? One of the things that you'll have to do as you learn inferential statistics is in the assessments, you'll have to practice writing out hypotheses. Uh, so I want to show you some qualities of what makes a good hypothesis here. The first is that a hypothesis is stated as a declaration, not a question. It is a statement. It's not a question. The research question is the question. The hypothesis is the answer. We don't answer questions with questions. We answer questions with statements. We declare what we think our answer to the question is. Okay, So that is the first quality of a good hypothesis. It is a statement about what you think the answer is to your research question. 
The second quality is that the hypothesis posits an expected relationship or connection between your variables, right? I've got a variable of math IQ. I've got a variable of reading IQ. And the hypothesis has to say something about, well, what's their connection between them? Are they different? Are they the same, right? So that is what, so the question usually brings that out. The question asks, is math IQ different, average IQ different from English major average IQ? And the hypothesis has to reflect that connection between the variables. So the hypothesis has to say something about, are they different or are they not different? If the question asks, is math IQ related to English IQ? The hypothesis has to say something about, are they related or not? So it has to have that second quality involved in it. The third is that, um, now, the third, this third point here is not something that's going to be relevant to when you're writing your own hypotheses, but this is an important point to know about how hypotheses are developed when, like, you're doing your own research. So you do need to know this conceptually, but you won't utilize this third point for writing your own hypotheses. And this third point is that a good hypothesis reflects prior theory and research. It's not just pulled out of thin air. It's not just what you think makes sense or what sounds good. It's based on prior work that's done. All science builds on science that came before. And that's what a good hypothesis has involved, is that it's built on prior work. Uh, the fourth one, now this point is relevant to you writing your own hypotheses, is that a hypothesis should be brief and to the point. It shouldn't be an elongated sentence that sounds very poetic or very, you know, um, uh, literature like it should be a clean, concise, and succinct statement. So it should be brief and to the point. And lastly, the hypothesis should be testable and thus falsifiable. So the te the hypothesis needs to be able to be proven wrong. It, there need, your answer has to have a possibility of being proven untrue, you know, or or false, right? Uh, if a hypothesis can only ever be proven true, then there's no way to know if it actually is true. One of the ways that science works is, is the way that modern science is done is that it uh, assumes that if you make a truth statement, the possibility that that statement could be false actually helps you know if it's true, if you have evidence to believe it is true. Because, hey, the evidence could have shown that the statement was false, but the evidence shows that it might be true. So maybe it is true. Because if a hypothesis can only ever be true, it's almost like, what's well, going to be true no matter what the evidence says. At that point, why even why even collect evidence? Why even put these questions to the test if my answer will only ever be true? So a good hypothesis is one that can be testable, one that could have been wrong, uh, possibly. Now, that uh, last point there, like the third point, is also one that uh, you need to know conceptually, but it's not going to be something that you'll utilize when writing your own hypotheses. So let's get into more specifics about how we develop these hypotheses. So the first kind of hypothesis that you will develop is something called a research hypothesis. This is essentially whatever answer you think is to the question, to the research question. Usually this, this hypothesis, uh, will, this hypothesis will always take the case of the affirmative. Uh, think of it as the hypothesis that says yes to the question. There is a significant difference, right? The question asks, is there a difference? The research hypothesis says, yes, there is a difference, or yes, there is a relationship, but that's what the question asked. The research hypothesis is also called the alternative hypothesis, and it's represented with the symbol capital H subscript one, right? Remember those terms? I tend to use the phrase alternative hypothesis more. You need to know both these terms, but just be aware that I tend to use alternative more. You'll see that more often on the assessments and also the symbol there, H subscript one. That represents the research alternative hypothesis. Now there's a second hypothesis that you need to develop. And this is essentially the hypothesis that says no to what you say, okay? So the null hypothesis says that there is not a difference. So the research hypothesis is whatever you say to the question. It is usually it's the affirmative statement. Yes, there is a difference. Yes, there is a relationship. And the null hypothesis is the one that kind of uh, brings everything down, right? It's the downer of the party. It's like, no, there's not a difference. You think there's a difference, and the null hypothesis is like, no, just no, there's no difference, right? No relationship. So I want you to think of the null hypothesis as the negation of the alternative hypothesis. It's not, I don't, don't think of it as the opposite. It's the more accurate way to think about it is negation. Whatever the alternative hypothesis says, the null is the one that says not that, 
If you say there is a relationship, the null says no relationship. You think there is a difference, the, alter the null says no difference. So it's the negation of whatever the alternative says. And this one is represented with capital H subscript zero. So think zero means null, nothing, right? Zero, zip, no difference. So the null is represented with H zero. The alternative is represented with H one. So let's give some practice of how we can write out hypotheses uh, in regards to the research question posed earlier. So the question asks, is there a significant difference? That's kind of positing the relationship between the variables. Between the average IQ, that's the thing that's getting calculated, the average. Between uh, the average IQ of math majors, there's our first variable. And English majors, there's our second variable. So you've got a relationship posited in the question, wondering about the relationship, wondering about the connection. Is there a difference or not? We've got a stat that we're going to calculate, an average. We've got our first variable, and we've got a second variable. Now, you start by writing the alternative hypothesis. So you say yes to the question. The alternative says yes. There is a significant difference. Notice how the first part of the sentence there is positing the connection between the variables. And it's saying, it's declaring something. The question asks, is there a difference? The alternative says there is a difference between first variable mentioned from the question, math, and English, second variable from the question, majors average IQ. Again, mentioning average, that's the thing that we are measuring, that we are calculating. Now, the alternative hypothesis is going to look identical to the alternative. In fact, a trick when you're writing your own hypotheses is Type whatever you type out for your alternative, just copy paste that for the null, because you only have to make usually one slight change to the null hypothesis. And it's simply replacing the A with no at the very beginning of the sentence, right? The alternative says there is a difference. And the null says there is no difference, no significant difference between, and the rest of the sentence is exactly the same. And that's what we want. Remember, we don't want the sentences to be flowy or flashy or or you know, romantic sounding in terms of literature in that kind of way. We want them to be clear, brief, and to the point. And in fact, it's very clear when you say the exact same sentence and only change the first part. There is a difference, yada, yada, yada. There is no difference, yada, yada, yada. And then you understand what the alternative is saying and what the null is saying here, okay? So that's kind of in a nutshell how you write out your hypotheses. Now there's some further details about these that you need to know. So let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little a one layer deeper into hypotheses. So the hypotheses that I just showed you are called non-directional hypotheses. These are hypotheses that say there is a difference. There will, you know, there, there is a difference or not a difference, but it doesn't specify what kind of difference. It's just saying there is a difference between math and English major IQ. Or there is not a difference between their IQ. But notice how the hypotheses are not saying, oh, math IQ is higher than English IQ or vice versa, right? If it were to say one is higher or lower, then you're getting more specific. Non-directional hypotheses don't get that specific. They just generally say, oh, there's a difference or there's not a difference. There's a relationship or there's not a relationship, right? It's not getting any more specific than that. So if the question... If the research question asks, is there a difference between X and Y? If it's not asking, is X greater than Y or is Y greater than X or so, or is X lower than Y or something like that? If the question just asks, is there a difference? Then the question is positing a non-directional question. Okay, the question is non-directional. If the question is non-directional, that means your hypotheses also have to be non-directional. So that's how you would know. If the question is non-directional, the hypotheses will be non-directional. And this is how they will look. The alternative, which you write first, starts with the phrase, there is a, right? That's the affirmative statement. There is a. You have to say significant difference. Difference is notating the relationship, the connection between the variables that was posited in the question. If the question asked, is there a relationship? Then you would say there is a significant relationship. But since the question asks, is there a difference between the variables, your hypothesis has to say difference as well, because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at if there's a difference between them. And you have to include that keyword significant. Make sure that you include that that is a technical term that you have to have in your hypotheses from here on out. And that term is going to make more sense in the next topic we'll cover. But for now, just know that you have to include that word significant connected with 
whatever the connection that is positive there. So in this case, we're talking about difference, so it has to be significant difference. Then you state your variables. State the variables in the same order they were stated in the question. If the question asks, is there a difference between math and English major IQ? The hypothesis will state math first and then state English second. So is there, a, there is a significant difference between math and English majors. And then the, finally, you would say average IQ. IQ needs to be specified because that is what you are at calculating. And what are you calculating? You're calculating an average. So when you're working with an average, you have to state average in the sentence, just like it was stated in the research question. Now the null, copy paste the alternative. The null is the exact same sentence. It, you just replace A with no. It's only that first phrase of the sentence that changes. The alternative says there is A, affirmative. The, the null says there is no, negatory, right? There is no, the rest of the sentence is exactly the same. Now, the last detail for non-directional is at the bottom here. The non-directional hypotheses require that you use a two-tailed version of the statistic that you're going to be calculating. Now, you don't know how that works yet. That's going to come up when it comes up. At this point, I just want you to know, and I want you to make sure that you know, that two-tailed test is connected with non-directional. If you're working with non-directional hypotheses, the stat you're using has to be two-tailed, okay? Just, just write that down as kind of a fact you just need to know. You need to memorize that, and we'll get more into that whenever it comes up later in the class. Now, the second kind of hypotheses are called directional hypotheses. This is when your question does get specific. This is when your question is asking if there is, if X is higher than Y or if Y is lower than X and vice versa. So when the question gets specific, the hypotheses also need to be specific. So you start with the alternative. The wording of the sentence is gonna be a bit different from non-directional hypotheses because we're getting more specific, right? So you start with your first variable. Math is mentioned first, so that's what you start your sentence with. Math majors, average IQ, you got to state what you are measuring, right? You're measuring IQ, and you're calculating an average, so you got to state that. Math majors, average IQ is significantly, technical term, and you're going to say higher or lower than English majors, average IQ, okay? Whatever the question says is which version of that you'll place. If the question asks, is math major's average IQ higher than English major's average IQ? Well, the alternative says yes to the question. So the alternative is going to say higher than, because the question asked, is math higher than English? If the question asked, is math lower than English, then your alternative would say, yes, math is lower than English. So I'm giving you, I'm showing you both options here, but you wouldn't write both of them like that. You would write one or the other, higher or lower, or greater than or less than, depending on what verbiage the question uses. But it's based on the question. Whatever the question says, the alternative has to say yes. Is it higher? Alternative says yes, higher. Is it lower? If yes, alternative says yes, lower. And then to wrap up the sentence with saying your second variable, again, specifying the average IQ, what you're measuring. Now the null hypothesis, copy and paste the alternative, and then you're gonna change whatever relationship was posited in the alternative. If the alternative said significantly higher, the null says, no, it's not higher. It's gonna say it's lower. And then notice the rest of that highlighted portion or equal to. Think about it this way. What, is the, what are the two ways that math IQ cannot be higher than English IQ? Well, the average IQ can't be higher if the average IQ is lower, right? Can't, it, can't be higher if it's, it, it, it can't be higher than if it's lower than English, or if the two numbers are exactly equal, right? Two is not higher than two. Two is not lower than two. Two is equal to two, right? So that's what the null hypothesis is doing. It's saying no to the alternative. And in a directional null hypothesis, there's two ways that it can say no to the alternative. It will say the other direction. If the alternative says higher, the null will say lower. If the alternative says lower, the null will say higher. It's always going to say the other direction from what the alternative said. And then the second way is if the two averages are equal. So you've got to make sure that you have that second part there. If you only include one of those parts, then the null hypothesis is incomplete. For a complete directional null hypothesis, you have to have 
it's specifying the other direction and the equal to. And then, of course, the rest of the sentence wraps up with the second variable and average IQ there. So that is, in a nutshell, how you would write out directional hypotheses. Uh, and just like with the non-directional, non-directional requires a two-tailed version of a, of a stat. Directional requires a one-tailed version of a stat. So again, just remember that as a group fact, and you'll know more about that as it comes up. So with that in mind, let me talk a few more things about null hypothesis as we begin to wrap this up, because that was the core of what you needed to know in this topic, is how the hypotheses should be written and what they're saying. Well, why have a null hypothesis? What's the importance behind all this? Why not just have the research hypothesis? Well, the reason why we have to have a null hypothesis is because when we are investigating something that has never been investigated before, which is what science does, science is trying to look at things that haven't already been looked at, right? Why invent? Why invent the light bulb when it's already been invented. So we're moving into new territory with science. That's one of the things that science does. So if you're moving to an area that has not been studied, you don't have any basis to say that there is going to be a difference or not. If you've never, if it's never been studied, if math majors are more are, are different in their intelligence than English majors, then you don't really have any reason to say that there is or there isn't a difference. So the null hypothesis kind of provides us a good starting point. It's the idea is that if you assume that there's no difference, then if you find a difference, hmm, that's evidence potentially that maybe the null hypothesis is wrong. And usually what we do is if the null hypothesis is wrong, we get rid of it and then we'll take our alternative hypothesis. This is why it's called the alternative. It's the alternative hypothesis we go with when we get rid of the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is a good starting point. It's a good assumption to start with. So if I assume starting out that there is no significant difference between the average IQ of English and math majors, really what I'm saying here is I assume that the null is true. If I find a significant difference between math and English majors, that could be potential evidence that my starting assumption is incorrect, right? If I assume there's, if I assume it's true, if I just kind of say like, all things being equal, there's no difference between math and English majors average IQ. Then I would expect to find no difference when I actually gather some data, right? Well, what if I do find a difference? Oh, that maybe that's evidence that my starting assumption is not true. Maybe my starting assumption was false and I should get rid of it. And I should assume something else, such as the alternative hypothesis. Maybe I should assume that there is a difference between math and English majors IQ. And so that is essentially why we have a null hypothesis. It provides us a good starting point. We have more reason to believe there's no differences, all things being equal, than that there is differences. We have reason to believe, we have a better basis to say there's no relationship than to say that there is. So this is that logic behind it. So how does this work out in terms of testing the hypotheses? Well, let's say that you get some data back that gives you reason to believe your null is false. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to make a decision. NHST is a decision-based process. Everything leads you to the decision about what to do with the null hypothesis. You start out assuming the null is true. You have evidence to believe that it's false. So what do you decide to do? You decide to reject it. Technical term. Make sure you know that. Now, if you decide to reject the null, then you're going to what's called accept the alternative. You're going to take the alternative as your going assumption. Now, if you believe the null is true, let's say the evidence you gather supports the null, then the decision you make is to not reject the alternative. I'm sorry, not reject the null. You're going to keep the null. And if you don't reject the null, then you don't accept the alternative. Really, you don't have anything to say about the alternative. You only say something about the alternative when you reject the null. If you don't reject the null, then it just kind of stops there. So you're not going to accept the alternative because you didn't reject the null hypothesis. So that's the decision making of NHST. It's all about the null hypothesis. Is the null false? Is it true? If your evidence shows that it's false, reject it. If your evidence shows that it's true, don't reject it. If you reject it, accept the alternative. If you don't reject it, you don't accept the alternative. Now, last but the last thing I want to cover as we wrap this up is what happens if you make a mistake when you're making one of those decisions? That's what these type one and type two errors are. They're when we make a mistake 
in deciding what to do with the null hypothesis. So here's this, what, here's one scenario. What if I reject the null hypothesis? But it was true. Oh no, it was actually true. And I mistakenly got rid of it. So I shouldn't have rejected it, but I did. Ah, oh, that's one bad decision. Now, what if I don't reject it? What if I keep it? But it was false and I should have gotten rid of it. I should have rejected it, but I didn't because I thought it was true. So that's the second kind of mistake that you can make. So the first scenario is called a type one error. And that second scenario is called a type two error. The type one error is when you reject the null, but it was actually true. You conclude there was a significant difference between math and English majors when there really wasn't because the null hypothesis was true. The null said there was no difference, but you concluded there was a difference because you rejected the null. Now type two is when you didn't reject but you should have, because the null was false. So you should have gotten rid of it. So you concluded that there was no difference between math and English major IQ when there really was. Ah, there was a difference. You should have gotten rid of the null, but you didn't. So that's called a type two error. Now, this little table here is so, so useful for remembering this. I acknowledge completely that that is confusing to keep straight because of the, wait, if it's this, then not that. So I should have done this. It's uh, it's just so confusing. I still get confused about it. And I reference back to this table here. So I encourage you to do the same. Start with what's in reality, right? If the, in reality, the null is true and you made a decision looking at the row, if you decided to reject it, I'm sorry, let's start with this. If the null is true and you decided not to reject it, you made the right decision. But if you did reject it, ah, you made the type one error. Now, if in reality the null is false and you rejected it, good decision. That's what you want to do. You want to get rid of the false nulls. But if it's false and you didn't reject it, you made the second type of error, the type two error. So we're not going to deal with type one and type two errors too much in the assessments, but uh, this is a concept that you need to know that you will be tested on um, in the quizzes, most likely. And so make sure that you review the type one and type two errors, can identify what which one is and when it comes up. Uh, so that way you can have that one down pat.